Welcome, ladies, to the Real Estate Investor Show, providing inspiration, strategies, and insight to empower women investors to live balanced and financially free lives. Now, here are your co-hosts, Liz and Andressa. Welcome back, ladies. This is Liz. And this is Andressa. Welcome back to the Real Estate Investor Show, and we are doing a what, Andressa? Minisode. Minisode, where 10 minutes or less, we go into something of use to hopefully all of you wonderful ladies listening. Yes. And we try to be as detailed but brief as possible, which is always a fun thing to do in 10 minutes or less. There we go. You're almost 30 seconds in. I know. So I got to get to the point here, <laughs> which is always hard for me. So what I'm going to talk about this week is different ways to structure partnerships. And I'll make this as interesting as possible because I know this is not the most exciting topic, but it's critically important as you invest in real estate because you tend to, as you continue on in this business, can't do everything yourself. And you may need to give away something to someone else to get the project complete. That's the simplest way I can say it. So I'm going to give you a scenario and then I'm going to go into a little more detail. So here's a scenario. You have a few friends. You want to go into partnership. Not, this is not a boyfriend or a spouse or, or that type of you know, partnership. But these are just friends, uh, colleagues, contacts, et cetera, that you know well. You want to buy a multifamily or a rental of some sort. Okay. Obviously, this is a long-term project. And maybe two of your friends have full-time jobs. And you are the person who already has the real estate experience. Um, and I'll give you one other scenario. Everyone's able to bring some amount of money to the table, right? So some people might be able to bring more or less, but that is something that everyone's able to bring to the table. So the really big thing here, when you're figuring out how to structure, now I say all this, first caveat, I say all this, please consult an attorney because obviously I'm not an attorney. You don't want to take legal advice from a non-attorney, okay? <laughs> However, I, I want to give you some real life experience to, you know, some scenarios, at least ways you can, you can approach this. So the first question you need to determine is, are you going to go down the path of an equity partner or are you going to go down the path of more of like a, len a lender? Third scenario is like almost like a JV. I, I'm not going to have time to go into that choice, so to speak. We're going to go with equity versus lender because just for the, for the point of today, but know that JV or, or you know, that is another strategy. But for today's purpose, equity or lender. Equity means that person has ownership with you and as a lender, they are lending you the money. They are not owning anything. They are literally lending you the money. They're going to get their money back at a fixed or agreed upon interest rate. Equity is a little bit different. So the next question that most people don't think about is for the equity part, lending is, is a little simpler. They lend you the money. You return it back when you refinance or sell the project. And they get, a, like I said, a fixed interest rate. And they have terms and, and what have you. A little more straightforward. Equity is also straightforward, but it's sometimes less used as a strategy. And people think, oh, I have to syndicate or I have to do something larger if I'm going to go down that path. And that's not always the case. So here's the thing with equity. You could either go down the passive route or the active route. Okay, as a potentially structuring the partnership. So I'm going to give you some, I'm going to give you explain here. When we did one of our first private money deals, okay, we went into an equity partnership with, you know, with the person. And it was a really small deal. It was two single family homes. It was, uh, the, the person had $50,000, um, you know, pretty much to put into the deal. And we acted as the like day to day, boots on the ground. We had the track record. We had experience in the city that we were investing. That was our role in the business. He was 50% owner with us. He put in the 50 grand. He personally guaranteed. And he also helped like, uh, you know, almost like be a, a weekly, we had weekly calls with him. So we would have strategy calls with him. And all so, of this was in the back of a napkin? Yeah. Yeah. No, it all was in, we created an LLC. We, we named it Third, you know, we, we named it with the address that the, the property was located, yes. LLC, and we put an operating agreement in place. This is our first deal with this person. I knew him, uh, but, you know, you still have to put everything in writing. And it was an, he was an active, he had an active role in the company, okay? We did not put any money in because what we put in was our track record, our reputation, and, and, and our know-how for the city uh, and, and for investing because at that point we were about Mm, six years into investing full time. So, but he was an active partner. He was an active, had an active role in the company. 
I say that because by, by becoming active, everyone has an active role in the company and there's probably a lot of legality around this, but to make it very simple, you get disqualified in order to have to syndicate or to create or to file with the SEC. That's really what that means is that you avoid that leg, if you will. And again, I say this all, please do your own research, but I know that from personal experience. Now, the other avenue is to be, to have that partner be a passive investor. So if that person is purely passive and all they're doing, all they're doing is putting in money, that is a passive investor. And whether you have one investor the way I understand it, either you have one investor or you have 50 investors in a deal, that is still considered you have to file with the SEC. What I mean by that, again, this is all from my own experience. Please check all this with, with an attorney before you do anything. Because you, in essence, they're passive. They're not doing anything. Our first investor in that other scenario I told you with the single family homes, they did... Um, they didn't do as much as we did, but they still did a lot and they were active and, and, it, and it was able to be disqualified from, from, from filing. So let me give you a passive scenario. We bought an apartment building, 18 unit apartment building, okay? We raised about $500,000 from five different individuals. Everyone put up a hundred grand. Whether these people are my contacts, my friend, we, we had a pre-existing relationship with these people, okay? We didn't advertise, the were pre-existing relationship we, we created a limited, a limited partnership, uh, put the paperwork together, had subscription agreements, and this was a syndication. This was something we filed with the SEC. These people were pur purely passive. They, get, they got financial reports. They got checks quarterly from, a, from a, um, quarterly distributions, but that is it. They didn't do anything else. So, and then you have private lenders. And I think the third option is obviously your private lenders. The, the key here is timeline and money. So if your project is contingent on a longer term project, um, not that that's bad, but again, the longer that, that runs, the more money you're going to have to owe your private lender. They don't care that your project went over a month. They still want their interest rate. They want their agreed upon interest rate, or you're going to break the contract with them. So, okay, I say all this because back to our scenario, you got three friends that want to go into buying a property together, a very common scenario for the women listening. Here's what you need to do. Very simply put, how active or how passive does each of the partners want to be? That question will then dictate what you do next. And if they want to be more active, they want to be more passive, that's going to dictate how you can structure this. If you don't have that question answered and you say, okay, well, everyone puts up money and I do all the legwork and well, that doesn't, they're not all active then. then. Then that's a different scenario. Then they're lending, they're, they're becoming an equity partner with you and you might deserve a bigger chunk of that. So then the, all the other things you can negotiate on is dictated on how active and how passive and also what their risk level is. Do they want to be an owner of the building or do they want to lend on the building? Do they want to be an equity partner or what does that mean? What are the risks associated and lending? Obviously, equity, we, we win together, we lose together. Lending is you win big, you lose big. I still get my 10%. So I just wanted to give a few of those scenarios. Above all else, I know this is a little bit of a, a detailed and data dump here, but you have to ask the questions before you structure the partnership. And there's yes, a lot of, before. That's the, before, but there's a lot of creative ways you can do it. And I have to tell you, most people are like, not talking about how active or passive people have to be. And if you want to, if you're nervous about the SEC, you better get that question answered. And there's other disqualifying uh, ways that you can, if you go into partnership with someone, that's just one of them. And that's one that I will share because that's a common one people don't think of. Um, a couple of things in closing, you really want to assess everyone's capacity. What is their time that they can give to this? And what is the money they can give to this? And obviously expertise, but time and money is a, is a really important one. And um, what is everyone's short-term, long-term goals? And get everything in writing. So that's what wow. I got for you today. You know, so you're basically asking like very specific questions. So let's say if the person says, I want to be active, you're going to go one route. If they say, I want to be passive, you're going to go a different route. And then you can kind of like mix and match the properties that you have with the people that you meet. You got it. Worse something you're right to happen 
Yeah. And if you don't have those conversations, especially with friends, I mean, it's great that everybody wants their own rental property, but you better be crystal clear and, and, and be very clear on what everyone's role is. And, and if you don't have this like down to the, to the T, get educated. You know, there's tons of resources out there, but if you're in real estate and they're not, they're going to look to you as the leader. So you need to be able to educate everyone before, beyond just the rental property, but educate people on what this might look like and how we might structure this and get help. You know, obviously a great attorney, uh, other people that have structured deals like this. There's tons of great investors that are doing this type of thing. So with that, have an amazing day, do something with what we teach here and um, make great things happen. Yes. Share with us on our Facebook community, on iTunes and every other social media. I'll talk to you guys soon. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to receive updates on our next interviews, go to our website, therealestateinvestor.com. There you can subscribe to our show, become part of our investor community and get updates on upcoming episodes. If you like our show, please share it with other women who would benefit. And don't forget to leave us a rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And as always, we encourage you to take one action as a result of today's show and put it into motion so you can live both a financially free and balanced life. Thanks for spending time with us. Ciao.